session tomorrow. No, we have a work session tomorrow. I think. Yeah. Good. Good. Anyone in here attend the um, Saturday night opening of the ground floor of Capital Factory here in the building? I didn't make it, but I'm curious how it was. I mean, uh, I knew something had changed when I came in the door and I saw people doing calisthenics down there. Was there calisthenics down there? I mean, I knew that they had taken over some of the ground floor, but I didn't know there was three different segments. It's three. I saw two. There's three. I mean, I suppose it's possible that I was kind of rushing in. It's possible I didn't count right, but I think I saw three entirely distinct things. That surprise me, though. That's great. I I'm slowly taking it over. Within a couple of years, they'll have to shut down the hotel. All right. <laughs> well, Airbnb will make it not so popular anyway. Couch surfing, all the other things. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a bunch of little capital factory works. <laughs> <laughs> all right. I think we have the not until Austin talks so to host so these big events where there's a shortage of rooms anyway. So Are you going to yeah. introduce him? Oh, right. I need if to. You wish oh, yeah. We need to do our All right. I do that thing. This is all right. This is a. Yeah. Alright, um, <laughs> hey everyone, welcome to the monthly FF Austin meetup. Um, most of you familiar faces, a few new ones, but welcome everyone. We do these about once a month as part of our education outreach on a variety of interesting topics at the intersection of law, technology, and just interesting things about the future. But um, what we like to do at the beginning here is um, have a brief moment to take any announcements from the community. So is there anything relevant to the EFI Boston community any of you would like to share with everyone? Oh, oh um, first, you were first, yes. Yeah. Hi everybody, my name is Tamika Crother. I'm with a nonprofit called Austin Freenet. I haven't been to a meeting probably since last fall, but it's good to be back and I wanted to announce we're having a symposium this Friday at the Google Fiber Space. It's on digital inclusion. We'll have folks from the FCC, Charter Communications, mm. Google Fiber, UT Austin, really talking about what this really means and how to set forward. Well, that's from 10 to 1. And as a former president of uh, Austin Freenet. I was about to say, Austin Freenet, Freenet sounds very familiar. <laughs> I wonder why. But no, that, that sounds great, everyone. I recommend any of you who can make that. It's Probably not me because of work, but anyone who can make that should go to that. AM, 10 AM to 1 PM. Yes. If, if you have a weird work schedule, do attend. <laughs> um, and John, you had an announcement. Well, my announcement is, and I'm double checking to make sure I've got the time and place right. Wednesday, Wednesday at 7 o'clock at Book People. Ah, yes. Our pal and former board member, Corey Doctorow, is going to be doing a book reading from his new book, Walk Away, and uh, we're going to make, we're going to have a presence, we're going to right. I actually, uh, front, but. I actually just emailed you saying that due to work, very good chance I can't make it, so hopefully you and Chris will be there to take advantage of Corey's kind offer to yeah, let the good people I'll, know about the yeah, FF Awesome. I think I'll be there, and I'm pretty sure Chris will too. Awesome. Um, so, um, I strongly encourage everybody to show up and support Corey. Yeah, I, uh, having read the uh, dust jacket blurb of his new book, sounds very interesting and relevant to our time. So I would uh, I would check that out if you were free that evening. Do you know the title? Um, 7 Walk p.m. Away. Oh, the title, Walk Away. Walk Away. But uh, 7 p.m. Uh, is when the book people event begins. Um, let's see. Anybody else have any announcements they'd like to make relevant to the community? Okay, cool. I'm trying to think if there's any... Uh, announcements the president would like to share with you all. Um, so um, until the end of the Texas legislative session, we're going to continue to have our politics team working on stuff. If any of you are interested in getting involved in those efforts, let me know and I can get you in touch with Josh Kahn, who's been doing an amazing job running our team this session. So if the political side of what we do interests you, let me know and I will get you in touch with the right people. Um, let's see. There's too much else to report. Um, I apologize for the man who been busy, but recently we've announced the community stuff. So yeah, I guess just as always, if you have a cool idea about what you'd like EFF Austin to be working on, do let us know, because we are very much a community-driven organization. 
So um, without me blathering on any longer, I'm going to give things over here to Rob Matney. Rob Matney um, is the COO of Polycot Associates. Full disclosure, our former president also works for Polycot Associates. But um, Polycot Associates is has the unique distinction of being, I don't know if you guys are literally the only one in the U.S., but you're certainly one of the only cooperatively owned web development firms. Now, a cooperative, what is that? Well, if you've ever shopped at Wheatsville, you probably have some idea about what that is. But specifically, how is that relevant to a tech company and how does that work? Well, that's what Rob is here to answer for us, among uh, other questions. Rob is also an acquaintance local <laughs> actor if you want to annoy him with questions afterwards as well. But anyway, I'm going to go over to Rob here. Thank you, Kevin. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's very kind. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm glad to be speaking at EFF. I've been a huge fan of the mission uh, and a supporter since long before I had the good fortune to know Kevin and John. Uh, so I'm glad to be here. Um, this is, uh, I have a few slides. There's not a whole lot of um, uh, data to give. I'm hoping to structure it mostly as a conversation and when we move into uh, uh, Q&A or, or better discussion. Um, I hope that it doesn't feel like it needs to go through me, that it's a shared conversation amongst you, and I'd love to, when we get there, lead it with everyone referencing their own name, uh, the business you're with, and the role you play there, so that, um, so that we can build as many rich connections around this topic as possible. Um, so I, I came to Polycot Associates uh, a few years ago, and, and prior to that I, I had worked for Apple, and then I'd worked for a small uh, software as a service company named Amicus, uh, and then I was freelance. And then I came to Polycot when John had a need on his team. We'll talk a little more about the history of Polycot in a minute. Um, while I've been really lucky in my, the, all the jobs I've worked, uh, I never felt like there was someone in a mask whipping me from above. Um, I longed for a certain amount of agency and freedom uh, that Polycot has given me reliably. And, and that has grown as we move towards being a co-op. When I joined up with Polycot, I didn't functionally know what a worker-owned cooperative was. I was a member of Weedsville, but that's about as far as my knowledge went. So this has been a journey of discovery for me, and as I discovered more, I discovered more what I loved about structures of cooperatives. So we'll talk a little bit about what cooperatives are. We'll talk a little bit about um, how Polycot came to become a cooperative, uh, and then hopefully we'll just open it up for questions and, and be uh, useful to you, and I may lean on my uh, admired colleague John to help me answer questions as they arise, as he's another source of information and may have information I don't have. Um, okay, um, so this is uh, is actually an older version of our uh, mission statement, a polycot, um, but uh, it, it was relevant to the topic of being a cooperative. The triple bottom line impact uh, was relevant for us. Uh, I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but that is our original mission statement as a cooperative. Uh, again, Robert Matney, I'm the COO, but the truth is we're a small team uh, and all of those titles have exactly as much BS packed into them as you might expect when a small team adopts titles like COO. But I do help to keep the lights on, uh, I help manage the project management process and help make sure projects happen uh, on time and uh, on budget. Uh, and I'm really honored to be a part of the team that I love. Uh, okay, so quick level setting set of questions by show of hands. Who here identifies as an entrepreneur? Raise your hand. Great, that's a good portion. Who is a business owner? Yeah, about a few less. Who is a small business worker? Uh, who is looking to start a co-op? Right on, that's exciting. I kind of thought we'd have zero, but I'm thrilled that there's a couple who might be interested in that and, and will really want to answer your questions. Um, you, you, quick popcorn style things that might be wrong with the typical American company for workers from the perspective of workers. Any quick thoughts about what you dislike about working for a typical American company? Yep. I don't feel personal ownership over the actions I perform on a daily basis. Nice, good. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Someone who worked for me once said that they couldn't see the whip, but they could feel the pressure. <laughs> nice, yeah, yeah, yeah good. I, I, any, anyone else? Yep. Oh, yeah, yeah, I find it uh, absurd, the distribution of wealth. Uh, yeah. yeah, sure. That makes good sense. And, and back there? So, uh, I met a recruiter recently who's been in the industry for like 20, 30 years. And anyways, I was chatting with her. And uh, one of the things uh, she has noticed, and uh, I've noticed too, is that Actually, apparently, 
there's a huge amount of like nowadays, you know, I don't know how to describe it, like, you know, just propaganda about how meaningful companies are, but that's really just, according to her, just aimed at like millennials because <laughs> it's just like a result of a survey. So it's like, at the previous uh, startup I was at, like, you know, they had like a weekly one hour long all hands meeting in which they would just like try to brainwash and and literally that was said, yeah, we want to be a cult and like so anyways, yeah, it's like we want to be a cult. That's wow. yeah, that's great. And, and, and it, it puts me in mind of that I'm a big fan of the show Silicon Valley. It, it works yes. for me and part of why it works for me is because I feel like it it skewers uh, me and things that I love in ways that hit close to home and, and make me laugh and make me cry a little. Yeah. Uh, and one of them is this bit where you know, pitch after pitch talks about changing the world through technology. Mm -hmm. And I laughed and then I looked at our mission statement and it said changing the world through yeah. technology. And I was like, it's funny because it hurts. Um, so no, I definitely hear that. So Rob, I should, I should point out, I, I talked to a guy who's been a CEO of a, a big technology company. Um, actually, one of our friends that worked there too. Um, and he was talking about their approach in putting the company together, and he said, well, I decided to study cults. So he actually studied cult and built the business with that framework in mind, actually trying to base it on a cult and trying to get people to have that kind of cult devotion to the company. Well, that really speaks to, to your point and this kind of current trend of popular company building. Hi, welcome everybody. Um, we're just having level setting questions right now. I've already covered what we'll talk about, but then I'm gonna talk about it, so I don't need to go back over that. Um, but welcome, I'm glad you guys are here. Um, in general, what would you say are wrong with uh, web development and IT? Popcorn style, if you were to pick one or two things that are awful about web development uh, or IT, if you're a customer of those teams or as you look at your colleagues or people in your community who do that work, where are places where uh, those companies get it wrong? Yep. I always find it's annoying. It's driven by marketing instead of by actual people with technical knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's what looks pretty versus what actually is needed. Oh, that's interesting. Yes. Okay. I would say somewhat building off that as well, but in general, framework and tool bloat, often with frameworks and tools being purchased by people who do not actually know what is needed to get the job done. Sure, we've yeah. seen that issue for sure. Anyone else with initial immediate critiques of um, uh, web development and IT companies? Yes, ma'am. So I'm having my website redone and I was sold this, oh, they were going to deliver this and that. And it started off with, I just had issues uploading my own uh, WordPress theme, my newest one. And then so they they charged me an extra month. They haven't done anything. For three months, they haven't done nothing. So, so making promises and not delivering on them. And it sounds like maybe initially making ambiguous promises that yes. are also not being delivered on depending on Absolutely. how clear that was. Uh, yeah. yeah. Good, thank you for sharing that. Um, and, and then I, I asked the, the question, who, who is familiar with what makes a worker-owned cooperative versus consumer-owned cooperative? Does anyone, by a show of hands, know the distinction between the two? We've got three that do. Okay, good. We're going to come back to that question. And then, uh, this is a, another kind of leading question, who is familiar with pla where platform cooperatives fit into that question of worker-owned versus consumer-owned cooperatives? All right. Also, by the way, I don't know I'd raise my hand. It's a, it's a bit of a mystery there, but we're going to talk about it a bit. Uh, history with Polycop. Uh, it was founded uh, by John Lipkowski in 2007 as a sole proprietorship. Um, and the current core team that we've grown a bit coalesced in 2012. Um, and, and this long bullet underneath it is relevant because it plays into why it worked for us, I believe which is that we were a group of freelance web developers with strong independence and initiative, sharing complementary skill sets, run collaboratively by virtue of John. So, so John initially spontaneously selected people who were inclined to work collaboratively. And if you know John, he is himself very inclined to work collaboratively. So in our early DNA, there was this sense of we share the decision making, even though, of course, John had the prerogative at that point in time to really make all the decisions and, and rule with an iron fist. 
uh, and, and uh, he, he, he ruled quite collaboratively. But we as uh, freelancers came together because we were seeking the, the cross-functional skill set and the teamwork support that you get when you join a team. So all of that is a long way of saying we were biased towards freelance and independence, but we found a certain virtue in sheltering together. Um, and, and though we have been formally a co-op since 2014, functionally, John ran it as a co-op for a good deal longer. Indeed, I'd say longer than my tenure with the company, which I think started in uh, 2012. Um, so here's some co-op types. There's consumer-owned. Uh, uh, earlier, Kevin talked about Wheatsville, which is a consumer-owned cooperative. Uh, <coughs> Uh, and this is a structure where the folks who are buying the items purchase a stake in the company, uh, thereby securing for themselves um, uh, you know, group buying power, lower prices ideally, maybe other values that get incorporated. Um, but it is not owned by the workers. The, though the workers may themselves be consumers who buy in, it's owned by the consumers, not by the workers. Uh, and that's a distinction that was not clear to me before we started investigating uh, cooperatives. So Wheatsville is one example. Um, REI is a kind of massive example of a consumer-owned cooperative. And then alternative to that is worker-owned, where the, the consumers, the, the customer does not own the company, but the workers themselves do own it. And this is how we're structured. There's a number of companies that are structured like this, though there's very few technology companies. We're not the only one in the U.S. Um, there's actually one in San Francisco, something just in a handful, really. Just a handful. There's probably 15 or 20, at least, that we've become aware of over time. Um, but there's a number of reasons why we think that the technology sector is ripe for co worker cooperative ownership, uh, worker-owned cooperative structure. And part of it is just because of the, the opportunity to forego um, you know, brick and mortar and the kinds of capital and infrastructure outlay that other industries have. Um, and then there are hybrids of those two. I don't know that there's too much point digging into them. There's some situations where as a consumer you can buy a certain kind of steak and as an owner you can buy a different kind of steak. Uh, and then somewhere in this uh, ecosystem fits platform cooperatives. And on the surface of it, it seems very clear that it's much closer aligned to consumer owned than to worker owned. Um, and uh, the sharing economy, at least in my opinion, is problematically termed because very often there's nothing sharing about it. Uh, it, it certainly there's a lot of profit extraction that's going on with, uh, with Uber and Lyft, and, and I actually use them reliably and, and like them, but sharing is at least a somewhat problematic term there. But uh, to the degree that they are a cooperative, they're a cooperative in the flavor of consumer-owned, or at least that's my assertion. Can I say something? Please do, John. Go for it. Thank you. I mean, I was talking to somebody about this today. Uh, so platform cooperatives, um, in the sense of like Uber and Lyft, it's a, those are platform-based companies. There's a technology platform that's critical to their work. Um, in that particular context, it's for ride-sharing. So ride-sharing, they had to build a technology platform that includes an interface for the the user for the person who's actually needing a ride and an interface for the driver and then a management structure or infrastructure to manage all of that stuff and manage payments and so forth. So the idea of uh, platform cooperativism was that there's going to be more and more platform based companies of various kinds that are going to emerge um, inherently it's like a, a potential growth sector and uh, there were a couple of guys Nathan Schneider and Trevor Schultz who came up with this term platform cooperativism uh, because they felt that platform based companies were ideally suited to become worker cooperatives and possibly consumer cooperatives thank uh, you hybrids Thank you. Yeah, that's, that underscores that what we see uh, as these platform companies fall a bit short, but that they're right to move in that direction. In, in worker-owned cooperative, or really just in cooperative uh, circles, where everyone's a co-op nerd, these seven principles are not only typically memorized, but they're referred to by their number, like, oh, number three, that's a virtue of. So these are the kind of dogmatic, 
principles that are part of being a cooperative. So voluntary and open membership, democratic member control, which is one that's extremely important to me. It's the one that I attach to the most personally. Um, member economic participation, autonomy and independence, education, training and information, cooperation among cooperatives, and concern for community. And that last one is something I'll speak to again in a moment. So these are the kind of core principles. And if you read that list of principles and you think, oh, well, that is something I align with. And furthermore, it's something that my company really aligns with or uh, as aspires to align with, then a cooperative might be for you, uh, potentially. So why did we want to co-op? Um, uh, excitement for agency and democracy in the workplace uh, seemed essential. This ability to uh, control your own uh, work hours and decisions within certain parameters um, of, of, of productivity. Um, the ability to, the opportunity to, to formalize transparency, to make sure that decisions were made uh, in ways that were accountable to all of us, that we all could really stand behind the decisions that we made as a company. Um, of course, there's a number of company ownership models. Co-op's not the only one. Uh, and all of them, to varying degrees, ensure buy-in for the workers so the workers feel that stake of ownership and the success of the company and hopefully good caretaking for the clients. Yes? Um, I'll just add, we thought about a partnership, traditional idea of a partnership. Um, and I'm sure you've noticed that partnerships they're kind of like marriages that can hit the rocks pretty hard. Uh, it's really hard to hold a partnership together. Um, and, you know, you kind of wonder, you know, why is that so hard to do? And part of it is because of a sort of lack of a commitment to a democratic shared ownership and, and also a, a lack of transparency and a, a transparency and a, uh, an inability or unwillingness to surface issues in such a way that you can resolve them. You know, you can, like coalitions form and people sort of go off in corners and start plotting and scheming and that sort of thing. Uh, but what we saw in co-ops was, uh, I mean, just thinking about the cooperative structure is that there is a framework for working all that stuff out so that you don't have the typical contention that can form in, in, within partnerships. For sure. And, and one piece of that, it's actually, uh, yeah, go for it. You, right on. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> right on. Good fidget away. Uh, and welcome to our most recent uh, arrival. Um, there is a structure in the cooperative movement called open books management, which is just an enforced way of putting the financial numbers on an extremely regular basis in front of everyone who's a stakeholder in the cooperative. Uh, and so um, this is another way of really making sure that sunlight is disinfecting the, the, the nooks and crannies of the company and its operations as we go. Uh, and it's something that we're iterating into. We've, we have done it some, but as you might expect, it's an, it's an onerous task to do that degree of reporting that regularly to that many people. And so we, we're a little bit hit or miss in iterating our way into um, success with open books management. Um, so more reasons why we wanted to co-op, ensure a humane approach to, to biz building. Uh, all of us came to the work with a lot of extracurricular interest, probably like all of you. And, and what we wanted was a business structure that, that didn't just tolerate it, but that <laughs> celebrated it. What could we do to really support each other uh, as a community in each of our various interests? So that when we show up for work, We've got a degree of trust and passion and, and, and um, uh, uh, support for each other that shows up in the work, but also shows up in the joy. Um, we wanted to create great jobs that people want to keep, and it is a, a, a metric that I'm uh, deeply proud of that since we became a co-op, we have a 100% retention rate of member owners. Now, we're not that big of a team, and it's only been a few years, but still in this business, as you know, retention rates are hard to keep high, and 100% retention rate is strong. Um, I mentioned earlier the triple bottom line. Uh, so, you know, we, we want to make sure that when we're solving um, for business problems, that we're also solving for social and ecological problems to the degree that we can. We're, we're committed to social justice and equity in our culture, and if there are ways that we can find a space in our work to solve for that, to say, yeah, that might be the most profitable, but we need to remember that this may not be great for society as a whole, it may not be great ecologically, 
for, for us to just have a space to even have that conversation is for me new in my business life. So now when we sit down at a member meeting, uh, we, we are all not only permitted but encouraged to suggest things that might be problems that are good for profit but bad for other parts of our lives and bad for other parts of the, the lives of the world. Um, and then for me personally, uh, I think a lot about uh, legacy and, and what, what I get to leave behind and I, I am possessed with the notion that life is short, work hours are long, and why spend some significant proportion of my life uh, reifying principles that I don't value. And if, if democracy um, uh, is as important to me as it is, then I want to work in a company structure that values democracy. Uh, so time is short. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we co-opt ourselves. So, um, as I mentioned earlier, we all had shared principles that we discussed uh, in an owner, uh, John, who was the owner of the sole proprietorship, uh, who had generosity and the vision to, uh, to let go of control uh, in a context where he could easily have maintained control. Um, and the, the idea of becoming a co-op was actually raised by our colleague Benjamin initially. Uh, it didn't take too much convincing for us all to come on board, but the one uh, person who really had the most influence over that decision which was John, and he came on board with it. Um, and then we began quickly having whole and small group discussions where we really just walked through the dust of what it would mean to become a co-op. So, you know, we're not a big group, but of course you have your partner that you do a ton of work with. And it, it became time to start saying, well, where, where the rubber meets the road, where is this actually going to affect this project manager, programmer relationship, etc. And so we had uh, several conversations that we then reported back to each other uh, how that went so that we could start socializing the notions of becoming uh, a co-op. And that was the early uh, work. And then we consulted experts because, of course, we didn't really know what we were doing and, and we needed to um, have some expert counsel. We contacted <coughs> Carlos Perez at an organization called Cooperation Texas. Their job is that they help companies uh, transform into co-ops and then once they are co-ops, welcome, glad you're here. Uh, once they are co-ops, they, they help them stay nourished and healthy. Um, we, uh, we also consulted with Jim Johnson at the Democracy at Work Network. Uh, and John W. Vinson at John W. Vinson PLLC was our attorney, uh, who is our attorney, who did a fair amount of research into what it would mean legally to change our legal instrument into a co-op mm -hmm. and how to do that in a way that was safe and sound. Um, and, and we should mention that Cooperation Texas doesn't exist anymore. Uh, well, they got absorbed into Democracy at Work Network, didn't they, right? Not exactly. Right? They, so the, guy, the founder left Austin and there was a big discussion about um, people taking over here um, and doing some of the work that they did. What Cooperation Texas was set up to do was to facilitate the creation of co-ops, to enable them, you know, to give them help. Um, but the way that they did that with us primarily was to connect us with Jim at the, uh, at the Democracy at Work Network. And when they, went, when they went away, the idea was that the other co-ops around town, uh, they asked us if we would kind of take over and start doing the work that they were doing. But people didn't have time, really. So uh, in effect right now, I don't know that we have a structure where somebody in Austin where it's clear where they would go. But if you came to us, what we would do is we would uh, we would suggest that you work with the Democracy at Work Network, which is also allied with the, uh, the U.S. Federation of Worker Co-ops. Yeah, I, I think that's the major takeaway. The, the Cooperation <laughs> Texas has gone away. Uh, Democracy at Work Network is alive and well and uh, is available for consultation for sure. Um, and when we, as we worked with these three experts, what we did was develop, execute, and iterate on an operating agreement. So, so it, it's our operating agreement that, that instances as us as a worker-owned cooperative. In Texas, there's not um, legal tax instruments for instancing as a for-profit worker-owned cooperative. 
about every other variation there is, but there's not in Texas a formal instrument for that. So we instanced as a, uh, a corporation and then use our operating agreement to then govern us as a cooperative, which works in terms of making us a cooperative and it's fully legal and it's a great way of doing it. Uh, we do hope across the long term that Texas catches up and starts <laughs> creating specific uh, legal instruments for worker-owned cooperatives in the same way that some other states have. Uh, Massachusetts is a great one, by the way. Uh, yes. So, do you just, uh, each of the members of the cooperative just reports their income on uh, uh, Schedule C? K1. K1. Yeah. Okay. So, it is a partnership. It's an, we it's said, a corporation, but you, I mean, it's, it's at least legally LLC. a partnership. Oh, uh, yeah. In fact, we're set up as an LLC. Okay. That's, what, that's what kind of I assume best well, fits, a, but like I could see why that's also awkward. There was an interesting question. There is actually a, a cooperative structure that the state of Texas supports, but the people we were consulting with felt that it was not a good fit for worker co-ops. They later said that they weren't sure that that was really the case and maybe we could have done it that way. But our advice from them was to form an LLC and then define the co-op in the operating agreement. Yeah. So that's how we did it. And as an LLC, you know, we're, we're K-1 guys. Well, uh, what the LLC can just do it on Schedule C. And yeah, but we get... Ten, 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 ten. <coughs> True, we yeah. are not, but that is possible. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, looks like there is also... Did that answer your question? Are we... Okay, cool. Uh, yes. Um, how expensive, costly, per member or total cost per year, it is, is it to maintain this co-op that you have, Polycop? Is it expensive? Is it costly? No. I mean, there was an initial expense of, of this consultation with experts that I think it probably ran three or four K maybe. What do you, I mean, I'm just kind of ballparking. Well, I think that charge is 2500 We had some other expenses, and we have... And then there was the attorney expenses. fees. But the... Uh, you know, typically when you form a company, uh, people will come together and, and look for funds of some kind and they may bring their own funds in. In a co-op, you typically have an agreement that a new member will make a cash investment in right. the co-op. Um, and uh, I think that's written into our operating agreement that if we take in new members that they make a thousand dollar investment. But we, we didn't exactly do it that way because we had all put a lot of work into it so it was kind of sweat, sweat equity we were already working we already had cash flow so we just surfed that cash flow and just continue to work as a business as a business and, and as a services company that was not too difficult for us to do in so terms of your cash flow is for yourself so this would go into this co-op in it anyway well it goes into the co-op in the same way that you want to uh, invest profit back into your own company, All right. no matter what kind of company you are. But in terms of hard expenses for being a co-op, there's no ongoing expenses. Um, there, there's us hopefully investing in our own process and our own, uh, uh, our, our, our own company healthfully. Um, so one of the best things that we did working with the folks at Cooperation Texas and Democracy at Work Next Work, uh, Network was to develop a decision matrix. Uh, and I'm going to take us over to it. I wonder, is that, that's not big enough. Let's see Where are you, you? Well, it's big little, enough for us to know that it exists, but a little, little enlargement things on the left right. <coughs> Where is it? I never lower, use lower, it. Lower right. Ah, oh, perfect. There you are. Yeah. All right, good. Let's see what happens if we do that. Boom. There you go. Is that better? Yeah. Uh, good. I put my glasses on. Read it. <laughs> um, so this decision matrix became the most essential tool for the the outcome. I think for us. Uh, we, we oftentimes don't need to consult it because we've kind of internalized it and we actually work at higher standards than this matrix uh, requires generally. But uh, w you know, if you're going to if you're going to start spreading out decision making power, uh, you better figure out how you're going to make that efficient, or you're going to run the risk of um, becoming ruling by committee in all the toxic ways rather than all the useful ways. Um, and so, when it comes to managing projects, we operate like. Joe Technology Company or Jane Technology Company. We have a project manager and we assign tasks and things have a, a roughly hierarchical structure that we're, we're quite collaborative from the ground up. Um, 
but there's a number of decisions that we need to reserve for the member owners and then we need to decide what's the structure for how we're going to make those decisions. So this matrix gives us the opportunity to speak in terms of who's the decision maker, who has to ratify, formally approve or reject, and whose input is required. And then identify all of the business, the primary business decisions that we expect to see over the course of our uh, work for the company and then to go ahead and define it by roles, by person or body. So we have executive, we have the body who oversees financial, sales, sales associate, project manager, tech lead, board of directors, worker owner, uh, all worker owners. Yes? Are these roles you described actually distributed across all your different um, participants in the co-op? Yes, these roles are distributed and mutually distributed. So any one person holds multiple of these roles. It sounds like you're talking now like a holacracy. Well, we actually explored holacracy quite a bit. Uh, one of the downsides of holacracy is that it's you've kind of got to fit yourself into their framework. But it's a, it's not a bad structure, and the idea of defining roles and having those roles being somewhat fluid, or or having the people in those roles being somewhat fluid, so that. You can cover different roles. Uh, more than one person can do one thing or another, and you can decide which roles you're going to energize and that sort of thing. Uh, that that's close to what we do. Yeah, you're right to make the observation that it is close, and it is close, but it's not quite the same. And we right now have foregone holacracy and its various siblings mm -hmm. by virtue of the fact that it is very process heavy, and we feel the burden outweighs the benefit. Yeah, I can only append to that. Um, I've kind of observed the holacracy thing for several years now. I'm close to some of the people around it, yeah. and um, the source code is very modular. So if you just like one element of what they're doing. Yeah. You can pull it out, plug it in. Um, for example, um, kind of onboarding people are that fluidity structure of roles. So um, there just may be an element that's right for your organization. And well, the the fact, you can leave behind. The fact that we study holacracy definitely had a, a, an influence on the way we do things. Indeed, the, I would say that one chief thing that has helped us that we've gone on to secure, and it feels very modular, is in meetings, uh, <laughs> the agenda is governed by who has attention, an issue that they wish to resolve. And when we're done with that agenda item is defined by whether or not that person feels that tension is resolved. Other people may have their own tensions and they can put that on the agenda, right? So this issue of, especially in member meetings, letting people bring up their issues, but then also govern whether or not their issues have been resolved um, has worked with our structure really well as a reminder uh, to keep conversation dense, focused, and not go looking for problems, which uh, is an easy, I think, problem in every committee, everywhere in the world. So, um, yes? How many employees does the company have right now? Because you keep saying small, but yeah. small could be five or small could be 100, yeah, 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 depending yeah. upon your scale. Good. We, we have five worker owners. We have one provisional worker owner who, who uh, we expect to become a worker owner before the year's out. And we have a small stable of contractors who are not worker owners. Uh, I think six right now is the number. And they have variable degrees of participation. Some of them do just a little for us a month. Some of them actually haven't done anything for a couple months. And others are reliable. The ones that are reliable are on, theoretically, a track to become member owners if they desire and we have a particular process for for how much time and how much work has to be executed before one is a candidate for taking the next step to becoming a member owner sure I mean that, that explains some of why you're saying there's there's role sharing and things like that I mean if you're a hundred person in the company you're gonna have much more specific <coughs> roles and more well-defined positions but if you have five people that are part you know the the owners then obviously you're going to share. Yeah, you're absolutely right. We have done our best, noting that it will have been flawed. We have done our best to think scalably. So for example, in our decision-making matrix, which has now gone off, um, we, uh, we have a board of directors. We're planning for a subset of member owners to have certain governance controls. But right now, the board of directors of the member owners is equal to the member owners. But we're trying to build in layers of abstraction that will work for us as we grow. We, we, we think a lot about scaling, and we're going to be really careful. We, our process for bringing people on board is cautious. Uh, we want a contractor to be 
uh, working with us for at least six months before we even think about provisional membership. And then we want somebody to go through a provisional membership for some number of months before, uh, before we and they agreed to work together, to have them come on board as members. And we had one person who went through the process and was really close to the point where uh, she would become a member. And she decided, for her own reasons, that that it just wasn't the right thing for her. That it was actually um, sort of something that she couldn't balance with other things she was doing in her life. So the process worked really well in that case, and uh, we expect it to work well going forward. And we should also mention that we're looking for a senior programmer with Drupal expertise. Indeed we are. We are looking for a senior programmer and developer with Drupal expertise. Yeah. That's true. In fact, we have a, a job description that we could be shared if you wanted to email me or tweet at me um, uh, after, after our talk. That's great. Um, um, so, you know, not so much expertise, you know, it's when you're, when you're smaller, when you're newer. I, I don't want to stand here and say we're the pros on being cooperative. We hope that we can share in the conversation and answer some questions, but this is a lesson <coughs> we're learning. Yes? Is it like bootstrap iterations or is it just like, let's try this, try this, try this? Yeah, um, uh, we have tried to be quite focused in what we iterate. So um, every year we focus on a few new processes, a few new things to try out, see how it works, and if it works, we keep it. So, um, uh, you know, we don't have a ton of structure around introducing what qualifies as a thing to try out, but we try to be pretty systematic, stick to our process for efficiency as much as we can, and then flag wherever we've got a, a process variance and say, okay, great. If we're doing a process variance, it's because we think this is a good idea, good enough to warrant a test. So let's test this and see how it goes and figure out what the right measurements for it for success are. Yes, Kevin. So if you operate with sort of attempting iterative or evolutionary improvements of change as a process, do you have any things in place to avoid the local maximum problem where you have kind of created, reached this stable equilibrium, but it's not the best stable equilibrium, but you might have to go through some chaos to get to that state. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great point. I mean, we, it's the, no, I don't know that we've resolved that problem, right? Because I think it's a kind of huge problem to resolve. I mean, it's a universal problem in any large organizational structure. We do find ourselves, even this week, asking some fundamental questions about our billing and paying structure that we cannot reasonably iterate into. That if we're going to do it, it's going to require transformation across a few vectors. So what we try to do is hold, iterate, iterate, hold, and then if we're going to make a plunge, make a plunge having done some due diligence and some analysis. Sure. Storing so, up everything else before the plunge. Yeah, yeah, and then just trying to be as wise as possible about it. But it's a great point, and I, we by no means solved that problem, you know. But, yeah, but you know, I would have been curious if you had. I would want to know what the secret is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, when you're and when you're thinking about, I mean, obviously <coughs> as we evolve, we're going to have to change and we're going to have to grow, especially as we scale up and add more people. And uh, we're at a point right now, as Rob mentioned, where we have some billing and payment issues with with the framework that we've got now for doing that and uh, the good thing about this is that we, we don't rush and we haven't like jumped the gun on trying to figure out some other system because we understand that if, if we don't study the problem and really get our heads around it that we may do as you say, we may adopt a system that works, but it's really suboptimal. It's not really the ideal system. So we're trying to figure out how to get to that ideal system. And it just takes some time and some thought, and we have to study some things. Like, you know, part of the question is, we've been using, like, standalone QuickBooks, uh, and it, it's starting to feel like QuickBooks Online might be a better solution. But on the other hand, we've heard that QuickBooks Online is not as robust as the standalone like computer based version. So we're not gonna just make the switch and see what happens, but we're gonna take some time to study and we're thinking about bringing in consultants to help us. That slow sorry, go ahead. No, I just that slow moving that John refers to of course has an attendant virtue and vice where the attendant uh, 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 vice is that we're not growing crazy 
crazy rapidly, right? Uh, that can be a virtue too, but, but it's not like we're seeing, you know, 50% uh, growth year over year. Uh, on the other hand, we've never been in the red, not once. So there is that great virtue, um, and, and, we, and we have always had quite solid books. Um, but we are cautious in our growth. Really, the, the measure for whether we, how we want to grow is whether or not it's sustainable growth, whether or not we think we could do that degree of growth indefinitely. We don't want big jumps that cause undue chaos, uh, cause a bunch of grief for everyone, uh, with short-term returns, probably, and long-term problems. I think you are about to ask a question, though. Well, I think I understand the operating agreement is what really sets the cooperative principles into play. Yeah. But you are an LLC, and there is essentially um, equity to be, or owner distributions to be given forth. And mm -hmm. if there's liabilities you need to pay up or, or owners need to contribute to make up the shortfall. Um, in what way are you really different than any way uh, of a partner? <coughs> and I say that because um, profits is obviously important for partnerships, but also something that um, one of my friends said the other day, which was she doesn't ever want to have a partnership a partner where she needs to count on that person to do the work mm. and yet can't fire them. So she only wants to have partners that are essentially silent and able to take their money and take their advice, mm. but they're not interested in, in being involved in work for the <coughs> delivery of things. Sure. You know, there, there are... You've got a few questions packed in there, yeah. right? But which is great, and I'm going to try to attend to them. Uh, um, there are cooperative structures that accommodate memberships that are silent. We are not them, but they do exist, and I wish I could remember the details. The more common structure is that there are no silent partners, and that um, ownership is equal. So as we add new member owners, we dilute our own equity necessarily. So it's a it's a one share, one vote capacity, and as you add more people, you dilute your ownership share. Um, you, you, there's a different vector, which is you know how you value how you valuate the each share. You know, so you, each share might be worth more depending on how your company is valued at different times. Um, we we don't need to answer that question yet, so we haven't really answered that question yet. But but we do have an ownership share, and it's equal across the five member owners. Does that answer? I probably left some questions. Next, I'm just curious in the end, what makes it any different than just a partnership where you essentially have to can't can we fire someone? Governance over decision making. It's a, so uh, the the different. I mean, your point that it's similar is right, except for where it's not. And where it's not is the careful governance over who gets to make what decisions, how. Uh, and so, for example, firing a member owner has to pass quite a high threshold uh, of of things. So it's a consensus minus one with the affected member having to sit out that decision. Uh, so in order to fire, it's a, quite a high barrier to get over. And that underscores the slowness with which we hire. Because when we do get into this, this member-owner relationship, we're in bed with them. It's quite, it's quite a close relationship. So. So, current and with your, so currently, for somebody to get fired, it would be three out of four of the people who are not the person online to get fired would have to agree to fire. Yeah, that's exactly right. But yeah. if you guys were 100 people, you'd have to have 98 out of 99 of people agree to fire the person? That's an accurate statement. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So actually, it's harder to get fired as you grow. Well, I actually, <laughs> by the way, I actually think that that, um, I believe that one is actually retained to the board of directors, ah, okay. which right now that is co-equal. So I think that's actually how we handle that, and that's one of the places where we wanted to use that layer of currently academic abstraction. Yeah, yeah. I was about to say that like, it seems like it yeah. would be almost impossible to get rid of a so, bad employee so if you guys all, grew large enough. If all member owners became, uh, if we didn't introduce meaningfully that layer of abstraction, you're going to be right. As it is, it should be okay. Gotcha. The democracy doesn't really scale very well. And we have that data now. Yeah, right. I can't imagine that we that that would be a sustainable growth pattern for us to get to that size. But we'll we'll answer and reformulate when we get closer. Uh, yeah. How does ownership work upon like exit from you know from the the operating agreement stipulates the payout and the payout okay. schedule is is the answer. So so you know if you if you leave either by your own will or or or, or because you've been required to leave through this voting mechanism, then there's a, an ownership stake payout and payout schedule that's very specifically defined. Um, yeah. 
uh, if there's any related questions, but but if not, I'll, I'll carry you, on. Do you feel like you got an answer to your question? Yeah, I suppose we didn't quite address the question of profit distribution. Oh, I yeah. suppose that if someone joins as a as a member and they get an equal share of the profit, uh, I just wanted to see if that's actually what's happening. Well, just yeah. uh, just to clarify, in our case, uh, people are paid based on hours of work right now. Um, I mean, that could change, but not probably in the That's a primary direction. way that they're paid. Primary That's not the only way that people are paid. Well, the, yeah, one way that people are paid. So much of the money that flows into the cooperative flows out through these payouts, which are like guaranteed payments to the members. Um, I mean, that's an accounting term that we've heard. But basically, it means you, you did work and you're being compensated for that work based on whatever structure you have for compensation. So, like, you work for 10 hours and you get paid so much per hour, so, you know. So it's basically the line between, like, your, your pay almost like as an employee of the, of the cooperative versus your pay exactly. as an owner in the cooperative. And, and those, those are not equal payments. Yeah. They're based on work. It's sort of like merit-based or work-based. Are the rates for everyone the same? Uh, mostly. It's, it, it, the answer, ba well, we have some we have some vari right? there's variation. I mean, I'm just curious if yes or no. Across like, the yeah. member owners, the answer is basically yes, with a very particular contract-driven exception in one case. Basically, member owners are yes. But the other thing about the distributions is that, so at, the, at, at periodic points, such as the end of the year. At least once a year at the and, end of the year. Yeah, and, so, and, and it's been that way with us at the end of the year. We see what money that we have in the till, you know, and we do the distribution. And that distribution is equal among members. And we do balance out. I think, you know, packed into your question is also, how do you handle if you add a member owner, uh, but they haven't, in a meaningful sense, contributed in the same way to that profit that is part of that year's profit that is part of the distribution. And the answer is we handle that through performance bonuses. We use performance bonuses to equalize. What's left over is, is profit, and then the profit gets an equal distribution. And we also have a bounty system. Uh, you can earn bounty points for doing various bits of work that are for the company. They're not billable, you know, they're just internal stuff. Um, so we agree to give somebody so many bounty points for something that we're tracking that. And at the end of the year, we have, when we divide the money up, we divide one share of all those profits and then allocate that share according to bounty. So uh, we look at who has what percentages of bounty points and we divide that share up based on that. Yeah, so the, the number of shares that are distributed in terms of profit are basically number of member owners plus one, where that plus one is the allocation to the bounty points. Bounty points are defined as items that are uh, not business critical, but valuable to the company, and you can kind of take those down as you wish, and then we distribute it proportionally against who got what points. It's just an extra way of uh, giving incentive for these important tasks that are never urgent. Uh, and so that's just an extra pay mechanism, yes. And so I take it this whole structure is kind of designed to, you know, respect that everyone is an equal owner and should be sharing the profits, but also sort of to address one of the big flaws sometimes lobbied against sort of communist structures of that I worked more, I deserve more. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think that's right, right? We, we, we you know, we have varying <laughs> degrees of, of contribution to the profit, and we have a variety of structures that reward us variably for that, that we've all approved and all can stand behind. And then there is a set amount of profit, and we joyfully share the equal heck out of it. <laughs> that's how that works at the end of it. Yeah, I, so an example, we have uh, one member who um, has become very valuable in one of our big, to one of our biggest clients, and uh, has facilitated uh, a major contract to do a big piece of work, and um, because of his role there, we we decided that he should get an hourly rate that is a bit higher than his usual hourly rate for that project. Yeah. So it's, you know, again, a, a sort of merit-based thing. I mean, he, 
It seems like the big distinction here, though, is that it's, it's even that difference in allocation is democratically decided upon, not kind of right. like a... Yeah. There's, there's wealth inequality, but everyone agrees to the wealth inequality. What it, the, explicitly, not just... And we have complete transparency. Anybody can see what the others are earning. And, and yeah. one of the things that in the decision matrix, which I kind of went a little bit quickly over, but we would be happy to share with anyone who's interested, was a pay rate decision making, and that is defined as majority of quorum of member owners. So, you know, variation, setting the standard and setting exceptions is a majority of the quorum of the member owners. So we have a process for democratically defining whether, what the pay rate is and then what, what variations are in place. Although the truth is we, we have come to all these decisions by consensus. Um, we've, we've never had to drop to just a majority. But. At, at that number, it seems like it would be difficult to only rely on majorities. Or yeah. <laughs> yeah. In general, we keep a higher standard of consensus than our operating agreement requires of us. And that's a good way to go for now. And as we scale, then we may fall back to the, the looser parameters of our I mean, and, and hopefully people in a, you know, in a group that small, when a, they can reach consensus without necessarily even agreeing with the majority view that led to the, you know, Oftentimes we have someone who says, I'm, I'm happy to go with what the majority feels. We, we, we certainly get you know, that as part of the decision making for sure. Well, as we said, we try to minimize process. And, I mean, we, we're all really experienced and you know, skilled at what we're doing. And we want to stay really focused on doing that work and getting, you know, getting projects and getting the projects done. Uh, so we... Uh, our consensus is valuable to us, our ability to do consensus is valuable to us because we don't get tied up in knots about anything. We really have had an easy decision flow so far. I don't think we've disagreed about, I think the biggest disagreement that we've had so far is about where to have the happy hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's probably right. Uh, yeah, no, we, we do, yeah, that's right. We've developed a good shared decision-making vibe together. Um, well, so here's some things that we've identified as, as contributing to, to what we see as at least our current success in this conversion and in this work. So one of it uh, is, is excitement about the cooperative economy, uh, certainly distinct <laughs> from the sharing economy. Um, we think that the low business overhead of our, we, we originated as a team of freelancers, uh, our mechanism of constantly video conferencing and not worrying about a brick and mortar works for us because we, we, we don't need huge capital outlays or capital maintenance, uh, maintenance for, for capital. Um, we're calibrated for transparency just personally, that helped. I mean, we're, we, we are not inclined as human individuals to have a lot of secret conversations. Um, and we do all have an incumbent sense of collaboration uh, and mutual trust that we built. And now we must build with new people who join. So far, has gone very well. And then in terms of the, the conversion, we had to have a willingness to prune the team. We had to change that original outlook. So everyone that was part of the team pre-co-op was not part of the team post-co-op. We did do a team reformulation. Um, nice way to put it. Uh, uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more in abstract and, 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 and uh, identi identity non-disclosing, hopefully respectful terms in a moment. Uh, some snafus and gotchas. Um, uh, you know, just the, the legal instruments and structures and getting clear on how you can do it and what's the right structure and then how do you instance yourself as a cooperative, what's the best way. You, you know, get a lawyer and get people who are, who are smart with cooperatives to help you make the right choice for sure. Um, the change in our tax structure, I, mean, I don't know that it's got us, but it certainly was a change in how we handled a variety of things, the change from W9 to K1. Um, and then uh, we had a, a great co-worker who just wasn't a great co-owner. Um, and there was some decision making and tractability. There was a kind of allergy to, be, <laughs> to thinking as an owner, to jumping between the different things that might be needed in the course of running the business. Um, and then it, I don't know that I would accuse, in this case, uh, uh, this, but one must look for energy vampires. I mean, I think this is true in every business. You find the folks who are sucking the good vibes out of the room and hopefully uh, work less with them. Um, and so in a cooperative, uh, the, the power of the vampire to, to suck things in it is less fenced in maybe than it is elsewhere. You know, if you, if you have a vampire in the wrong place, it can really be a problem. 
Hire slow for skill and culture fit. I mean, this is almost a cliche now that you need to find a good culture match, uh, but I would assert that it's even more important when it comes to worker-owned cooperative. Um, and, and your folks have to have a high degree uh, of trust and mutual caretaking. I mean, you need to, frankly, be kind-hearted people, actually, as part of the process. And that's weird to think in... Uh, perhaps in, uh, to think in terms of how you're hiring, but it's actually, you know, people need to deliver the goods, they need to do the job, but they also need to be fundamentally calibrated not to want to take advantage and get the most for themselves at all times, uh, which is not always easy to find. Um, okay, so uh, that's that's all. I know it's not a bunch of data that I gave, but I'm hoping now if there's still time, and I don't even know. I mean, you've only used it a little more than half the time you're doing. Great. Right. So, so my thought is just to open it up for conversation for as long as that has its momentum, and as long as people want to, I'm happy to field questions, but also just facilitate other people talking. Yes. Um, I'm working on a proposal now to submit tomorrow for an idea of a cooperative. Uh, a caretaker cooperative. It's basically a company constructed out of people with mental diagnoses that cannot that have cognitive surplus but cannot work in a work structure. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to figure out what to call this entity. And I, you know, it's it's to help you, but it's not really designed initially up front to. Is take you more than sustaining your life rather in, in complexly. Um, it's not like you, know, you, you work, make money, you get a profit, you contribute, and your help, your, 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 and how you can, can contribute is optimized so that you can contribute more. And um, I'm just fishing for ideas, mm -hmm. for things, some words I can look into. Does anyone have an immediate response? I'm happy to give one of mine, but if someone else has an immediate response. Yeah, this is for everybody. Yeah. Uh, I would just say that naming's always hard and don't waste too much time on it rather than spending time building the company. Well, this is the opportunity. You know, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm just yeah, saying, I've been in that position myself as yeah. well. And, um, it, it's easy to get overloaded with the meta stuff, like the corporate structure and the naming and not focusing on the actual making money part, which right. has happened to me multiple times. Um, <laughs> So I would just say, uh, we're not going to make money. We're just going to rule the world. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 that would just be my suggestion. Yeah. It, it, so, any, sorry, I can't actually help you to <laughs> the conclusion. But uh, any other? Somebody's been in that position. <laughs> right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think to to your point, I would I would I would say my first questions are, what is it that you're, what is it that you're selling to whom? So it sounds like part of what you're selling is services to help people um, facilitate their work life uh, in, in a better way, you know, meeting their... Initially, meeting it's, their, it's mm -hmm. being bootstrapped, so that could be a component. Mm -hmm. and initially, I thought of it maybe loosely as a think tank with uh, mm -hmm. utilizing um, uh, high-functioning autistic individuals. Oh, okay, okay. So, so if I'm hearing you right, your, your, your product is, is knowledge and expertise. Right. Clients come for knowledge and expertise, and as a cooperative, what you're doing is reducing the barriers of the, whatever are the, the, the work limitations that you find in amongst your cooperative. Yeah, it's very diverse what, what um, autistics have to deal with. So uh -huh. most of, mostly, they're very sensitive to what's in their life. And it can sidetrack them and derail them for extended periods of time, even years. Am, am I hearing correctly between the lines? And correct me if I'm being presumptuous. But that that you're also looking to let that think tank be a think tank about the issues and concerns that affect this it particular could, group of it people. Could, it, it will have to figure itself out. So that there's the understanding itself, understanding um, that you're working with a um, a different organization that what has been that's common means that you got to figure it out. I mean, I think cons a, consult a consultative services firm as a worker-owned cooperative who takes care of the particular needs of the worker owners, uh, one, is frankly what we are, and two, it sounds as if it might match, and the, and the yellow flags uh, would just be around what, what are the work productivity stipulations that are at the core that you need to accommodate and how viable are they in terms of, you know, getting profit early on and, you know, supporting the business? Well, you know, more talk. Yes, good. Um, I, you, you raised your hand a, a moment ago, I think. Was there anything you, you wanted to, to share or discuss? Um, 
I'd like to let him know I'd love to speak to him afterwards. It <laughs> seems like a brilliant concept and really appreciate what he's offered. Right on. Okay. And I sense that there should be a co-op formed for naming other co-ops. <laughs> co <-op>, <laughs> co <-op. laughs> That's great. Uh, any other thoughts or questions or ideas you guys want to share with each other? Yeah. Um, obviously, you already had a functioning business that was already earning revenue um, when you decided to use a co-op structure. But have you ever investigated using a co-op in a, in a corporate structure that's taking outside investment? Um, similar to this question about selling partners where you know, you're looking for investors. Typically, I think that doesn't fit into the co-op model, but just some thoughts. Can um, I answer that? Yeah, please, John, thank you. Yeah, okay. We are actually working on a, a separate business that will be formed as a cooperative. And uh, we, uh, there's a couple of guys, Nathan Schneider and Trevor Schultz, who uh, I think I mentioned earlier, who have started this like platform cooperativism movement. And uh, Nathan was here in Austin, we talked to him about it, uh, and he's been advising us a bit. And he said, um, he said there's definitely ways for co-ops to get investment, which, I mean, we sort of hadn't even imagined that that would be the case. And I just spoke to him today and he actually gave me some ideas about how that could work. So we are forming uh, a new business that will, will not be this co-op, it'll be a separate co-op. Um, I think most of us will be part of it, and um, um, that business will uh, be looking for an infusion of cash in some way uh, through, there are some investment um, strategies that are starting to emerge for co-ops. And because it's, its services are a little more commoditized, it, it likely has better chance for scaling. Uh, and, and I think that makes it also a better target for investment possibilities. Okay, so are you talking about more non-traditional types of investment? Or, I mean, obviously, it sounds like you're just starting to investigate this, so maybe you don't have the details yet. But I know there are some like non-traditional investment styles now that are available that would work more with a co-op structure. Well, my question is, what's the ROI, you know, in a co-op for, um, for somebody to make an investment? And there's one organization that invests in co-ops, and they take they take a position in the co-op. They they have they so take a member a member uh, maybe a specialized member. There's some structure for them to be included in the distribution, and that's how they make their profits. Or to be you refer to it as being like dividends, you know, for them. Uh, our, our, our research is, I think, so it's new and it's yeah. a bit mild. If you have any ideas, <laughs> we're all ears. I'm curious. I work with startups and, and, you know, like, obviously the startup world is focused on, you know, unicorns and, um, you know, taking large ownership positions in the companies, you know, the investors. So, I'm, you know, I would like to see less investor ownership and more employee ownership. Um, but you st a lot of times you still need to have investors up front. Um, so I'm just curious about how to make that work. Yeah. Um, and I, I had mentioned this to Josh at Capital Factory about like there should be a presence for co-ops. Some, somehow we should be talking more about these cooperative structures. I think that they're, I mean it's really funny that we live in a democracy and most of our companies are formed as oligarchies. Um, it does make sense to have democratic company structures and there, there's really diverse ways to do that. You've heard kind of how ours is formed, but they can be formed in different ways. And there's other kinds of co-ops, like producer co-ops, like uh, Ocean Spray, the cranberry company is actually a co-op, but it's a producer co-op. Yeah. Uh, so the co-op thing really deserves a lot more discussion, <coughs> and the, the ways to facilitate co-ops, especially through investment, deserves some sort of creative thinking because I think that uh, it absolutely makes sense to use this structure more and um, we're certainly going to advocate for it in a big way. There are a few that I'm alert to. There's the, there's one in San Francisco who funded the Red Rabbit Bakery here in Austin, uh, which is a bakery co-op, a worker-owned bakery co-op. They're actually um, defunct and out of sorbent in the Wheatsville now at this yes, point. Yes, that's right. Yes. 
Uh, but they did get substantial funding. It didn't work, but they did get substantial funding. Um, and then there's also an organization called Cooperative Fund of New England, which really focuses on accruing investment dollars and then investing in cooperatives. But I think there's a, there's a lot more for us to learn, and I suspect there's also more room in the space. And it looks like there's two fresh questions, yeah, or responses, or? Go I was gonna definitely say, you'll probably see the city of Austin start directing economic funds towards cooperatives as we see the impact not just economic impact, but the impact with uh, uh, the employment and the other uh, communal services that actually stem from that. Uh, the United Nations actually in 2013 directed a lot of energy towards cooperatives, which is where you'll see some of the grant money that originates on a higher level. Not really focused on Austin, but the interesting thing is some of that with the National Cooperative Business Association they spun off the ACBA here for the sole purpose of raising the cooperative impact in Austin specifically. So I think Benjamin with the Polycott team, he was one of the people that was running for a position on that board. I'm not sure where that ended up, but uh, there's, there's a lot they of... They just voted, so... Oh, they just voted? Yeah. You know, and John so, has a co-op. Yeah, I was actually going to say, um, I have the unique success of actually starting a web hosting co-op under Texas cooperative law in 2013, it was from the 2005, uh, I can't remember the specific, chapter 251, which is, uh, it was geared towards producer co-ops, but at the time we were like, well, we wanted to do a worker co-op, but like there were the legal provisions, so we didn't want to do the LLC because we had to make sure the members legally owned the data. So for the sake of Texas law winning there, it worked out, but there's definitely a lot of general uncertainty even from the banks because the banks other than UFCU because they were technically a co-op they get it but you go to a lot of other places like hey we need money it's like oh, what are you who has the who do we put the pressure on if something goes wrong you know there's a lot of uh, bigger level questions that come into play with the financing but I think at least in this environment we'll, we'll be in a position where we'll start to see some of that materialize from the city. Yeah, just credit, as, credit you know, unions are a lot like co-ops and yeah. they actually consider themselves co-op a lot of the time, so they may be a source of funding too. Yeah. yeah. The we're members group. of your co-op. Yeah, actually Polycott is a member owner of Web Hosting Co-op. So. Uh -huh. What's the name of that hosting company? What's that? What's the name of that hosting company? No, webhosting.coop. Oh, did you know that actually we're moving over to our website's going to be on you guys? Yeah, no, we were going to donate it, but somebody paid for it. So <laughs> <laughs> that worked. Yeah, but. Well, it's we need to find time to finish transferring it, but that's yeah, how it works. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm an owner with you guys like three times over through Polycot yeah, yeah. and then twice elsewhere. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. It's nice. Definitely um, more or less pushing the issue of knowing where your data resides and knowing who your digital neighbors are. We're actually, we were in the position of uh, initially when Drupal and Open Public and Node.js and Socket.io, they had all the uh, video chat integrations and everything was working great and then Drupal 7, Drupal 8 worked, doing all that jazz and a lot of those development trees stopped so we didn't go full ramped up with it but there's a lot of uh, potential for some of these platforms like the voting elements, Wheatsville's voting when that goes online and they can expose all their members versus drop-in ballots. Or I was going to say another resource that we found really beneficial was Blackstar. Because Blackstar, our lawyers took their bylaws and were like, this is what you need. <laughs> and they want you to use it. By all means, test this in legal circumstance. So I would definitely say Blackstar.coop, their, their resource bank is huge for the worker on side specifically, but it's still applicable to the other. They have a beer. Yeah, they have a beer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Lots of delivery. Oh, yeah. If you want beer, go to Black Star, keep them open because they almost went under. Yeah. Yeah, but open. when I said they're going to go under, they really did good. Uh, I know. <laughs> but it works, it but can't rest on your laurels. You want ethical beer, got to keep going. Uh, it, it, popcorn saw anything else? I feel like I saw some hands, and I don't want to be the governor of this. Just go, I think. Yeah, yes. Well, I mean, one observation first, and then I have a question. But I think I've, I've run an S corporation for the last 17 years, and I think I probably would be approved. Uh, my partner is my wife. I probably could, could use your decision matrix. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to send you an email from Patrick at the uh, business coach and ask for that decision matrix. We often talk about how we're married to each other. I yeah. can relate to your point. Yeah, so <laughs> I, my wife it. wonders why I keep saying I'm so cooperative. <laughs> <laughs> just change all the letters to H and W. Yeah. The other thing is, I mean, I, I just went through a, a hiring, I hired someone on Friday, and I'm trying to remind myself not to hire slow, but also to, to fire quickly. And I think over 17 years, I've not fired quickly enough in time after time. 
And it seems like the weakness of the model is that lack of ability to make a quick decision on firing someone who's not working out very well. Yeah. Um, so that's just an observation. Um, yeah, no, that's great. It's great. And then the other thing I would just say as a question, I, I'm curious if you've investigated the employee stock ownership plan, kind of ESOP business structures, and whether that's appropriate for anything you're doing, or whether that's more like, like my friend is going to do that in his company, and he has a manufacturing company with um, factory workers and management, and the way it's different than your kind of peer circle of five smart guys or people. So I'm curious if you investigate anything about employee stock ownership plans, how you accumulate and buy in the stock, and do you know anything about that? Uh, no, we, we haven't researched. I mean, we fairly well uh, started and ended the question at, do we each have an equal share? Does it dilute as we add people? The answer to both of those is yes. And, and then questions of, of stock uh, haven't been taken further. So, there, so, so no. And, and I'm not sure yet where it would fit, though I'm intrigued to do well, some think, more research. I think, uh, in our structure, the division of equity kind of has to be equal, and that you know, that would be a structure where it wouldn't be. But I can, I can imagine having a co-op where you had some portion of the company carved out for, to, to be shared in, or sold as stock. I can see that. I think the Maybe premise of my, my friend is basically he owns 100% with his partner, so 50%. Yeah. And they want to eventually have the employees buy an increasingly higher ratio of the stock that he presently owns 100% of. So he wants to end up with a situation where his employees now own 89% of the stock after 13 years, and he owns 11. And that eventually grows the point. But he's trying to do that for the reason of ensuring long-term um, stability and employment and sharing risk. Yeah. It's capital intensive. Yeah. I'm wondering what the benefit is for you guys. You have low overhead. You're all peer peerish. Yeah. Um, you all had some cash flow beforehand. What's the big upside other than just friendly co-workers. Well, when I started working with the, the contractors that were the first guys that I worked with, my main concern was mitigating risk because, you know, occasionally when you're a web developer, you get stiffed, right? And I didn't want to be in a position where I had commitments to, to contractors and then I didn't get paid for the job and I still had to pay the contractors. So, the, the real start of our uh, tighter relationship was in getting an agreement from the contractors that uh, if I didn't get paid, that they didn't get paid. Uh, in other words, an agreement to share the risk. And, and that agreement also in, uh, involved me agreeing to some profit share, right? So that was the beginning of the evolution toward the cooperative that we have now. Mitigation of risk is, uh, though, is a real foundation of the, the way that we operate. We've, we've sort of operated that way all along, and Rob said that we've never been, we've always been in the black, and that's one reason, is that we've been uh, conservative in our money management and have really focused on mitigating risk as much as possible. We have structures for doing that. And maybe related to your question, when we did make the formal conversion, the, the member owners, inclusive of John, bought John out of his stake. And so he bought back a portion of his stake. And in the transaction, um, uh, uh, you know, made a, a healthy portion. But because there had been this pre-existing agreement to share risk, it wasn't 100%. It wasn't a purchase. So he, he yielded informally some of the ownership over to the workers in that transaction to buy the company as a worker-owned cooperative. And you know, this risk mitigation thing I just said, it may sound like I was being really smart, but I should tell you sometimes the stupid things I did to get me there. Because <laughs> I, I definitely had some difficult moments that helped me understand what that problem was. And it's, a, you know, it's a problem for if you're a big web development company, you're paying salaries to people, uh, or, you know, technology development, whatever kind, uh, services company, and you have people who you can't get work for, so they're on the bench, that can really suck your profits away in a big way. So one, one of the strengths of our organization is that um, we get paid according to the work that we do that's billable. 
and we're building enough, enough work for everybody to be okay, but we're not paying somebody something for, for just like sitting there and, and, and not doing billable work. No retainers. Correct. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Um, and that's one of the cataclysmic changes that we're investigating. Uh, yeah, go ahead. I have several questions, so I kind of synthesized them together. I'm just curious about, um, for both you and John, um, awarenesses and influences, but also from the room, of um, the following. Uh, Michelle Bowens and his foundational work with the Peer to Peer Foundation, which was very much ahead of his time. I think he started seeing a lot of this stuff in 2005 and six. And yeah, he's a friend of mine for a long time, and, and I think that his work is monumental, really. I'm a blank slate with regard to him. I know nothing. Michel Bowens, um, French guy. Um, I think he's been very instrumental in platform cooperatives as well. Um, he's just meta meta guy. He's just publishing stuff, and he doesn't even know how many people he's influenced globally. He's just amazing in that way. So great guy. P2Pfoundation.net, I believe, is his hub. Uh, That's it. I'll remember that. Thank you. I'm going to have to start reading that, too. Yeah. Good. Thank Great. You. Um, and then, um, so Ken Wilbur, who as another meta philosopher guy, um, definitely seeded a lot of what went into holacracy and other organizations. I feel like I've read a bit about Ken Wilbur. I couldn't tell you what, but I feel like that's been part of my meal. more about Ken Wilbur than I think, but we've talked about it. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, cool. Oh, nice. And then finally, um, Scepter, C-E-P-T-R. Um, it's a platform co-op out of uh, Oakland, California, where um, they're doing some really neat um, network architecture redesign to the level of um, asking, you know, how boundaries and structures and permissions and, and spaces, cells, and are even created in the first place. I mean, we're talking meta-meta, and then um, building sort of network architectures that respect that, and, and then that, that open source data can go in and help structure organizations. Um, I really recommend a YouTube video, CEPTR, Scepter, C -E under the hood. Uh, it's the most exciting three boring hours you'll come across. I'll be in the area in three weeks. It'll, I'll do some research ahead of time. Yeah, they're very accessible. If you wouldn't mind, would you mind on the meetup for this one sharing a comment with these resources so that people can yes, check them out later? I will. I Thank you very much. Right. Thank you. Any other thoughts or, or yeah, yeah, it looks like there's, uh, yeah, maybe let's go here. Um, one other resource that I think is interesting is uh, Robert Keegan uh, wrote a book recently called uh, An Everyone Culture. It's not specifically co-op um, centric. It's, uh, they, they, he focuses on something called a deliberatively developmental organization. And I don't think any of the three companies that he mentions are co-ops, but um, interestingly, the, the, the way that they're structured is um, radical transparency in, in a lot of cases and um, just a tremendous amount of feedback. They're, you know, they're, it ha it has, it's cooperative in practice, if not in structure. Um, and it, there's some really interesting ideas there, just about the idea that we're in, you know, the, the overarching guidelines are, we're, we're looking to grow. We want to be here because we want to be coming, you know, we want, we want to continue to stretch our abilities and, and become better at what we do. Um, so there's, a, there's kind of a common uh, purpose there that I think is, is very interesting and, and that book I really highly, highly recommend. Robert so, uh, Keegan. Yeah. yeah, so if you also wouldn't yeah, mind maybe that. sharing the link to the groups, that'd be great. Thank yeah, you. Actually great. Meant, uh, an influence on me was uh, I worked for Whole Foods for a while uh, and I don't know what, what they're like now, but when I worked for Whole Foods Market, uh, they were committed to a high degree of transparency and a high degree of employee involvement in the way the company operated. And uh, that was certainly an influence. Uh, Kevin, you had to um, Yeah, this a little bit of a digression from the current one. I just was kind of curious, like, so it kind of was touched on a little bit earlier, you guys, you know, how there was an existing sole proprietorship that got converted into a co-op. I'm curious what your thoughts would be for starting a tech or web-based one from scratch, per se. Like, what if just me and... Uh, five buddies have been working on some open source project on GitHub, or like, let's make some money off this and we want to start as a co-op. Yeah. Is there differences in process when doing it that way? Or? Well, you don't have to do a conversion, right? You well, just, yeah, I mean, in ways I think it's easier. It, the, the part that's harder is you don't have an existing cash flow. Is, right? I was wondering, so, like, do you have thoughts on mitigating that major problem if you aren't starting with an existing cash flow? I mean, I, you know, my initial impulse is start small, with a project with someone that you can trust and rely on and start making money on it and then grow from there you know just in other words you might say literally start with a co-op of two people and because there's fewer costs the less employees you know, etc 
Yeah, I mean, I'm, th this is my bias, though, and I feel like I'm in Capital Factory, and that is a, per perhaps a wimpy approach, you, you, you know, but, but I, I think if it were me, I would mitigate risk by choosing a great partner and making something and starting to make some money and then grow it from there. But, I, you know, I, ideas that have been floated about the rich possibilities of investment that might right, be Right, I know, there, we, we I talked suppose. about that some tonight as a possibility. Well, you, you've got to get people who can well. commit to co-ops and commit to a new way to, to think about doing business. And, you know, you really should study the way co-ops have worked so far and what's worked for other people and that sort of thing. I think that's important. Yeah, I can add one more thing to that. Just like I said please. earlier, worry more about making the money first and yeah. like get that part and make sure you can actually work with those people. So like in, in you know, obviously in this co-op's case, firing somebody is a challenge and you know, if you're going to work with friends, working with friends is a lot different than hanging out with friends. <laughs> well, we all know that. Um, it's, 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 make sure you can actually work with them. If we fire them when they're still contractors, that's easy. Right, right. But that's what I'm saying. Like you require a, a time investment now in order but if you're starting from scratch with a couple of friends, um, start working on projects together before you spend the 5K to put together the corporate structure. You know, like start actually seeing if you can work together, see if you can actually get projects, see if you're lacking skills that you need to find in other people. Like actually work on building the company and getting the work before you worry too much about the structure. Because you can, like you were doing, you can treat it like a co-op before you legally structure it like a co-op. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, and I suppose theoretically you could structure it like a co-op where you have one member owner yep. and like us you have a stable of contractors that you can fire very quickly and we have before, right? We thought it was going to be a good match, it wasn't a good match, we didn't do any more work with them, you know, um, and keep that flexibility and then when when the right variables show up, that's when you, 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 you know, invite into being a member owner. You know, one thing I want to mention before we get out of here is that in terms of influences, I had a, an amazing and very productive working relationship with a guy named David Swedlow. <laughs> and David, the stuff that David and I talked about and worked on certainly had um, had a, a real impact on me. And I think this thing about me being really collaborative and really sort of being able to work within this structure, I think it started with David and I working together some years ago in, in the very earliest days of Polycon Associates before these other guys came, came on board. Thank you. Yeah. Questions Please. for Kevin. Yeah. Since you're asking money for the meetup, are we, are there any problems? Or are you just, are you just looking for a little bit of cash on the members? Oh, um, I mean, we actually, oh, I mean, speaking of EFF Austin, there had been some talk that we were thinking of maybe starting to establish sustaining memberships, actually, much like uh, NPR or groups like that do, actually. Um, yeah, we, we always need money. You know, politics ain't cheap. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's no real, EFF Austin is not a 501c3 at this point. We're more a Texas nonprofit, and we actually, the board's been having a lot of debates about our, uh, structure politically future wise um, there's been talks about doing 501c3 conversion there's also been talks about keeping Texas nonprofit and having a 501c4 that handles our politics for instance there's a number of competing options we're debating on but um, yeah you know um, sustaining memberships has certainly been one thing we talked about cash revenue um, obviously um, Affinity corporate groups are good for cash, like especially if you're friends with people who work at cybersecurity firms. They are a natural corporate ally of what we do. We've had luck raising money from them, so that would be helpful, you know. Yeah, if you want us to throw a lot of good parties. Yeah, because, you know, the party you all enjoyed, it was great. It was not cheap, so we do need money to keep those things going. But, you know, EFF Austin, me speaking now as a former president of EFF Austin, is an organization that is run on talent and not money. So volunteer energy um, is probably as desirable or more des as or more desirable. I, I would say that that is the current president. We can have all the money in the world. If people don't want to do the work. Nothing's going to happen. And up to this point in time, uh, nobody on the FF Austin board has ever been paid. None of our volunteers have really ever been paid unless we specifically contract with them to do some work like on one of our parties or something. It's very much it's a passion project for most of the people involved. So we don't actually have very expensive operating costs. It's just to do certain things like the parties or 
to get political capital to buy access, basically. These things just do not come cheap. Yes, yeah, um, please. The, the other thing that's interesting, and I continue to think about this, but I also like uh, Douglas Shrushkoff's book, um, Burning Rocks at the Google, Google Bus, yeah. for platform yeah. cooperatives. And there's some really, and it's an interesting perspective, specifically with looking at um, competition versus cooperation and kind of what the dynamics are there. Yeah, Doug was really involved in the, in the genesis of platform cooperativism, too. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really intrigued with the, that it seems that, <laughs> Just looking at a high level, that capitalism has done a really good job of amassing the wealth. You know, that's one of the things that Doug says that it's kind of an interesting idea that it's not so much bad players; it's the operating system. That's what it does. And so, in a sense, and and I'm going to draw an analogy similar to um, eukaryotes coming evolving to consume the oxygen produced by all the prokaryotes in the early days of evolution. I think we're at the point now where capital needs to be redistributed in kind of a, kind of a, a feminine distributive fashion and balance with the masculine I'm not getting a little bit, <laughs> you know, focus um, pulling all the all the capital to one place. And so I think that, you know, as somebody else said, the, the idea that um, there's going to be possibly, very likely, uh, high technological unemployment for various reasons, it seems like the, the reason I bring it up is because I'm very interested in the ideas of cooperatives becoming um, evolutionary and highly, highly efficient, you know, really starting to become a, 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 a vibrant ecosystem of, of um, innovation in terms of figuring out how to work out work things and stuff. And I know that right now it's very complicated and cumbersome and you have to work through and think of all of that stuff. But I'd really like to see, in some ways, sharing the, the, the workload of that so that it, the barrier to entry to co-ops is a lot lower, so it's it just increasing that. You know, a lot of people right now are very focused on governments and government process and all the stuff that's happening there. And oh my God, it's, we're in such a terrible condition now. But the thing is, there's a lot that we can do just in our lives, day to day, that's pretty revolutionary. And it, I think would tend through its energies to offset the sort of... Uh, Unfortunate things that our governments may be doing, or our governments they bought it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and you know, just just a bit. I think that's like a great comment. You know, and like literally, I, I think you can make a very strong case that it is a flaw in capitalism's operating system. I mean, it's literally Thomas Piketty's thesis that that's what the operating system does over enough hundred years. Um, and yeah, I think I think you make a good point about evolution as well. That you know, complain all you want about capitalism, the reason it sticks around is that it is a very self-reinforcing operating system. Attempts to disturb its equilibrium right themselves. Like, so if we want to replace it with a more ethical, sustainable model, it's like co-ops. It is important that we focus on making them self-reinforcing structures that are robust and, you know, are not going to be toppled easily. Well, you know, the principle six, right? Principle six is cooperation among cooperatives, right? And, and I would just say, at the risk, by the way, of being cultish uh, and, yeah, and kind of not a cult, just highly right. dogmatic, right? At the risk of ranging into that, uh, I, I would just say that one doesn't have to want to be a, in a cooperative or form a cooperative to recognize that democratic functions within governance uh, and ownership amongst workers these are useful and valuable tools in the long-range goal of redistributing wealth in a way that is sustainable. Uh, and so if, you, if you're out there in the wild and you hear someone who wants to make a cooperative, uh, you know, uh, pa pass them to Democracy at Work Network or, or forward them to, to John or I or whatever and think, you know, a little bit of action to just connect the networks. There's so much incumbently that works against the formation of co-ops uh, that just a little bit of extra network forming out in the wild can make all the difference for people forming really humane but effective and productive companies. Yeah, democracy can be really difficult, but it gets a little bit easier if you have a generous spirit. Yeah, yes, please. Are there any international, you know, long-running, uh, I know that in this country, you know, I mean, they're very much an outlier, 
co-ops, but uh, from what I recall, there's something going on in Spain. Mondragon. Ma 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 say it again, John. Mondragon. Mondragon. Right, right, right. I mean, I'm just curious, are there like any more? They're the largest co-op co in the world. Uh, they're a giant. I don't. I can't remember the numbers anymore, but they're extraordinary. And and um, and the great big sort of global cooperative get-togethers are by virtue of that almost always in Spain. So, uh, but but there's other big ones. Uh, I could look up a list and maybe post them to the meetup. But Mondragon is the big one. Well, I'm just wondering, like, are you guys like looking at them for whatever, like you know, lessons to learn? Or whatever, <laughs> like you know, how can they survive for so long and grow to be so big? And we have looked at we. I mean, I don't, I don't think that we want to be huge like that, you know, we, we'll probably stop at 100,000. <laughs> in uh, in our good dozen. You know, it is, it is worth asking an interesting question about if there's something about Spain as a culture and a government structure in general that's fostering this, because Spain is also the site of the world's largest internet peer-to-peer -peer network as well, over 20,000 households on their own version of the internet that unlike the internet is a true peer-to-peer -peer network with no central nodes of power which are leading to most of the major problems we keep seeing with the current internet. Yeah, it's just a mesh and it's just, there's no server client architecture, it's just true peer-to-peer. -peer. What is this space? Finernet was kind of like that. I, I forget the name of the network in Spain, but like, but yeah, it's the biggest one in the world. It's like 20,000 households. They all, I think they just are all their own Wi Fi hotspots and they all just share with each other, basically. There's a guy named Tom Jennings who started a network called Finernet, which was uh, sort of like the internet sort of. Blew it away as it started mainstreaming. Oh, wait, I, I heard about We should bring back FidoNet yeah. on wireless. <laughs> oh, yeah, FidoNet, that's actually that's funny. Instead of dial up. <laughs> oh, yeah, actually, FidoNet. Tom Jennings is right. a friend of EFF Boston. We should get him to. Actually, he's a great speaker, too. It'd be great if we could get him to come. And actually, no, I was actually reading a paper about it recently. It's actually one of Rich McKinnon's old papers, actually. But yeah, FidoNet was a Usenet competitor, basically, yeah. back in the old days. And Tom was a total anarchist. Well, Fido predates Usenet, doesn't it? I mean, right, it uses a somewhat different protocol as well. We'll get an EFF Austin BBS set up. <laughs> if you want to send us up a BBS, we won't say no. <laughs> I did an interview with Tom in 1993, and I should find that thing and post it to the EFF Austin side. You should find it still. You know, it's still interesting. You should find a lot of old archive media because I've got all the meetups going back to the current iteration of things, but uh, there's a whole page waiting for that stuff. Uh, <laughs> How do you feel about the balance between the contractors and the and the owners in kind of the structure? Just because, like, you know, since the the goal is clearly to be a cooperative, is there any kind of I don't know, in, enforced through the governance like balance between like you know, if you had six owners and a hundred contractors, it doesn't feel like that's in the spirit of the cooperative, but. Indeed, it wouldn't. In fact, there's a there's a kind of cooperative certification organization, and this ratio this this ratio is one of the factors that that you will not succeed in getting certified. So if you're I don't remember what the percentage is, but if your ratio is X to Y, too many contractors or too many non-member owners to member owners, then they won't certify you. So so I mean you're right. It would work against the spirit of a worker-owned cooperative to have a massive. Uh, ratio of, of non-member owners to member owners and in terms of how do we encourage inclusion and how do we ensure that we're respecting the contributions of our contractors in ways that are fundamental the the decision-making matrix has as input role uh, for the contractors on an awful lot of the decisions. So there's a lot of decisions that they don't get a vote in, but we cannot vote on until we've taken the input of contractors. And I think there's even a couple where they have to um, they have to vote on. I don't remember right now off the top of my head, but the, we, we do work to ensure that we're inclusive of our contractors. And how do you feel about like, I mean, obviously because you're all equal owners, that I guess potentially, you know, depending on the generosity of the group as a whole, like, might exclude people you don't feel can be, you know, somewhat equal contributors to the overall, you know, like someone who's very junior and you're like, you know, look, this might be a great learning environment, but we don't know it, you know, like, they might, you might expect to spend a long time as a contractor just under some hypothetical, well, because you 
have a different expected contribution, you know, like not just in hours work, but just in your ability to. It would probably be a, a matter of hours. Though. I mean, if, if somebody was more junior, and we kind of have a situation like that now, a more junior person would uh, probably be paid less because, you know, you'd have a junior rate. Um, but really, we would just want to make sure that they are enough of a fit skill wise as well as otherwise. Um, that among other things, that they can be kept consistently working. We, we actually have uh, somewhere in the operating agreement, it says that the members of the co-op are expected to work at least, at least 10 hours a week. 10 billable hours a week. 10 billable yeah. hours a week. So if, if we had somebody who, because of their skill level or whatever, we couldn't even give that many hours to, they wouldn't be a really great candidate. But, you know, it's possible to have a contractor that is not consistently doing a lot of work. Like maybe they come in and do a little bit here and a little bit there. Um, but it's spotty, so they're not as good a, a candidate for membership. Well, I mean, I'm just curious, just from, you know, just because like it was mentioned that someone who might be a good coworker might not be a good co-owner. Yeah. Know? And like that in, inherently implies that like, there is somewhat of an, ex, you know, like an, ex, you know, somewhat of an exclusion process that goes on there because you're having stricter requirements basically to be part of the club than you would That's to right. be normal normal part of the company. But Certainly, you, oh, go ahead, Jim. Well, I would just say that the contractors we bring in, we really want to work with people who are potential uh, members. And if we had a contractor who, where we had the kind of, well. We do actually have this formalized. In the operating agreement, the, the provisional membership track is formalized where if you are a contractor and you have worked X billable hours per week for Y duration of time, uh, then you you get onto the member owner track necessarily. That can be preempted, it can go quicker, but it, by that point, you're on it. And within six months, you either have to be accepted into the member owner uh, as a member owner, or you have to be told that we are not going to accept you as a member owner. You then have the choice as a contractor to keep contracting with us because just because we don't want to work with you as a member owner doesn't necessarily mean that we wouldn't love to continue working with you as a contractor but we have to be responsible and not leave the question <coughs> ambiguous uh, w without a, a timeline uh, based on the feeling that that could be irresponsible if someone comes into the circle thinking I want this uh, it, it would be it would be unethical of us to withhold that decision indefinitely and keep them uh, on the hook, as it were. So, See, the way I'm thinking about it is I don't think that a person who was unlikely to be a good fit as a member would contract with us on a real persistent basis. They might come in and out, yeah. but anybody who we really had a lot of work for and they were working with us a lot, the kinds of things that would lead us to not want to include them as a member would probably lead us to not want to include them as a contractor. So, so far, in actuality, this problem has solved for itself. No one has, who has fulfilled all of the criteria hasn't also then wanted to go into the provisional membership track and, and us want them to go down that track. So. No, I'm just, but I'm just wondering if it's like inherently, you know, I mean, I, I get that there are positive benefits of being self-selecting, but there are also potential trade-offs of it being self-selecting that yeah. there might be people who are great to work with in lots of different ways yeah. who are just not you know a particularly good fit for this uh, I mean from my perspective and of course we have we would have to hammer this out on the anvil of member ownership you know discussion I would be happy as a clam to work indefinitely with a great contractor who just isn't a great owner that they, they do their job, they do it reliably, they do great work but having that ownership perspective isn't their jam if they're happy with the contract work, then it seems to me like that, uh, you know, that would be great for me, you know, in terms of, as long as it's a healthy relationship and everyone's happy. But over time, they would see other people have more power over what happens. Maybe that would be un unhappy for them, in which case their contract presumably would cease. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit speculative. I, I really tend to think that people who really persistently work with us will probably get onto a membership track, but it's... It's hard to say. I mean, Bob tried right. it, and it could be that we have somebody who we really like as a contractor, but they really just don't want to do the membership thing because 
it's a different level of responsibility. Yeah. Uh, the, the one person I mentioned, somebody who went all the way down the membership track and then left, you know, she'd be welcome back any time. Um, uh, but she made a decision not to be uh, become a member, and, and I think a big part of that was when she realized the level of responsibility and commitment of energy and time that was going to be involved in that, and she had other stuff going on that was meaningful to her, and she just decided she couldn't balance all those things out. Uh, so it's possible that we could have a contractor who was sort of like that. They really couldn't they really couldn't make the membership commitment, but they're good and we like working with them and they stay on board. I'm just thinking that the people who are likely to have more of a future with us are going to be people who, who Seems can likely. get on the member track. So far that's proven true. Yeah. I'm, I'm almost curious though, like, do you think maybe looking back at something to learn from that particular case, do you think maybe you didn't make clear early enough on in the process what being a member under truly meant in terms of responsibilities. No, I think that her other stuff just kind of grew, you know, and and um, she just went through changes. And uh, you know, at one time she felt very passionate about the co-op, and uh, and I don't know that she ever lost that passion about it. I mean, she felt a strong commitment, but I think that there were other things that. Um, other work that she was doing, particularly art. We're all, in fact, everybody in this, in our group, has some kind of art thing that they do, and uh, and that was true of her too. But she was, she was getting more and more into doing her art, and she was going to school and studying <coughs> art, and um, I think that that was sort of filling up more and more of the time. And I don't think that she. When she first got on the member track, she realized how how that was going to evolve. In terms, though, of always wanting to be learning, I think that we can never do too much in terms of making it plain what the end goal is. And so, can we learn from that? I I bet I bet we can with everyone just be as explicit and clear as possible. And we'll probably never be perfect, but we can always get better at it. I, I just see that yeah. being maybe an important thing in general, just because co-ops are unusual enough that the vast majority of American workers aren't actually that familiar with them and what they consist of, especially in the tech world where they're almost unheard of. Yeah, and you might know, but not internalize. Your, you might know you, you factually, know, but not but internalize you what know, it means. You sure. know, right. and so we probably tell you for granted that people understand when you're an owner, you're an owner, you know, you really have a lot of ownership responsibility. Um, and we just get that, so we, we may not make that clear enough. Up sure. Front. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure we can always do it better for sure. Um, we had a couple hands go up, and I'm just time checking us. We're at 8:50. Yeah, um, so we do want to start trying to keep these short, start wrapping it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah go, go for it. I was just going to say to facilitate the open membership as the principal, it's definitely best to have all the cards lined out up front as far as what the expectations are. To draw on examples of where you can do the approval and like the living, the housing co-ops here, the college houses. That's probably the best example of. Uh, how to get over that fear of bringing people in by knowing the means of getting people out as far as membership reviews. So mm -hmm. I'd say as far as the fear of bringing people on and, and then having to deal with the consequence of watching people go, if you just go to some of the meetings that are most of the time even open, 21st Street Co-op, Lower Unions, Sasona, you can watch those processes go through and it's not, I mean once it's happened a few times, hopefully you're not having to go through a bunch of membership reviews, but for the most part the onboarding and outboarding as long as they're laid out, it, and everybody can agree on it, you're good. Just have your bylaws that support that. So. And we, we have gotten pretty clear about what are the responsibilities and duties of an owner, and you can objectively measure whether or not someone's living up to those duties, and then you have the mechanism to eject them if they're not living up to that. And housing co-ops definitely have a lot of familiarity with having to eject people, so you can get information about that. I think I saw a hand earlier up yeah, here. <laughs> cool. Good. I, uh, I have good. one more resource to add. Um, a, a week or two ago, another web development co-op posted their operating agreement on Hacker News. It generated like 200 comments. There's actually a ton of interest. I'll post a link to okay. the meetup group. The company's maybe you guys called um, Field Train. Field uh, Train. Field Train. They they like released their operating agreement for people to use or you know comment on, and there was a lot of discussion about it. So I'll post links to both their operating agreement and the 
I can't wait to read it. I can't wait. That's great. Thank One you. of the unique things they did was they actually restricted the maximum number of members. Uh, so they actually said, we want to have a maximum number of eight <laughs> members because they wanted to stay small. We, we talked about that. That was one of our considerations. We ended up not, but, but we talked about that. Um, electronic, electric embers. That's another great web dev cooperative in San Francisco. Uh, and they, and we, we, we asked them for their operating agreement and we adopted some fair portion of it into our own. Uh, and they, they do great work too. They do equal exchange. Uh, they do web dev for equal exchange and other companies. And I, I just think their design work is on point and I've never seen poor performance in their sites. I'm, I'm an admirer and fan of them. Cool. Uh, anything else as we wrap it up? Anything? Do you need to wrap anything up, Kevin? Um, I, unless somebody has some closing business they want me to give time for, I think we're good. Um, yeah, as always, you know, um, you know, meet up uh, the mailing list or great list to follow our work or Facebook. Um, always check the website. We also have a Slack channel now. If you're interested in getting in that, just let me know. Give me your email. I can add you to that. But yeah, you know, if you have any ideas about what you have Austin should be working on. Uh, get with me. We have a number of things we're sort of thinking about, like we've been thinking about trying to start maybe a cyberpunk movie night or something like that. So, you know, come to us with ideas because, you know, there's a lot of energy and a lot of ideas for I got one for you. EFF does burlesque. <laughs> we'll get back to you on that. Right. <laughs> uh, cool. Thanks for having me, guys. I really appreciate right. it. Right. Thank you. This is exactly what we ideally want out of a talk. You did great. What's up? Uh, no, the bike company folded, and uh, I just sold my last Bitcoin like two weeks ago. <laughs> Unfortunately, I wish I had made it so Every time I see him, I think I'll buy some Bitcoin. Just went up like three hundred dollars. Well, yeah, I the only person that takes his mobile in this game is their executive producer. And that was based on the person who ran. Like, I was on the $10 for the tech office and I'm all in the world. Everybody was all the And even that example is right up But they got a grant for the legislature to get hired on just for the It's been a while. It's good to see you. How are you? Life all right? Yeah, life all right. I barely did. Yeah, well, I think you should like that. Uh, uh, yeah, I love you. I, 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 I look forward to hearing more when the time's right about your plans. Uh, I just don't think it's in the early stages, but yes, I'm very, you know what bounced off for me? It, it may be silly, but it bounced, what you were presenting as an idea bounced off the idea of an accessibility, um, web accessibility, uh, yeah, consultative no. <laughs> that, that serves the interests of those who have the various uh, concerns that require accessibility, right? Now, I'm not saying it's the same. I'm saying there's something similar about saying, look, this is a fiction with a variety of expertise, and one of them is, you know. There's possibility of going in for a consultant type work. I also think it's possible to develop IP unreleased until it's ready. Oh, perfect. Yeah. yeah. I love it. All right. I look forward to hearing more when the time's right. Sure.
and, and I will just add you into our directory so that because we you know, obviously need to keep a directory of experts in different technologies so that when things become relevant, we know who to contact. You know. Thank you, that's great. Thank you, Charles. Uh, good. Well, I look forward to it. Uh, well, let's connect. I'll put you on the record. Oh, no, you're great. Oh, no. It's an awesome public conversation. I don't want to. 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 And that's where we left it. So that was like a week ago. It was about time for me to say it. It was about time for me to say it. It was about time for me to say it. I think I still very like it. I said, you know, you all directed it. I'm going to ask somebody who's like, sir. 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 If it's easy, send me an email and so that I can record it right, but I bet you I'll remember. That email will be very useful for us. That's okay. Because they donated an account. I got I'm sorry. That's like a So you wanted to have an appointment with me. They were able to get off the map. Right when you started down there, Set up a little I'm just 
I'll just be sleeping. Yeah, I mean, it's not great if I don't have anything else. I don't know if I 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 have anything else. I don't know if I